So this is a slotted model where we have that the uh, base station receives a signal into the k slot where yk is the k slot receive signal at the base station. The total number of users is n. Uh, Hkn <laughs> is the channel of the nth user in the kth slot with respect to the base station. AKN is the activity of the, n of the nth user during the kth slot is equal to 1 if the user is active and 0 otherwise. XKN is the packet or even the symbol sent by the end user during the k slot. And zk is the noise in the k slot. So what I'm trying to say here is that we can say that xkn is a single symbol, and then zk will be <coughs> a single noise sample. But we can also say that xk is a group of symbols, which is making a packet. But then it will mean that HKN is the same for all symbols, and AKN is the same for all symbols. So that means that if we have a slotted system, we say that one slot has, for example, M symbols. <coughs> and in the slot, the channel of each user is constant, equal to HKN, and the user is active or inactive in that slot. That's a slotted model. So it doesn't make uh, sense to activate the user per symbol. But on the other hand, it makes sense to look into symbols because they are kind of what is eventually modulated to some data, right? Uh, so as I said, the same model can be used to reception of a symbol, except that when we have a reception of a symbol, we assume that for many symbols, A, K, N, and H, K, N are the same. Uh, and, you know, it, reception of a packet over a slotted quasi static channel. The important point is that the channel is not changed during the single transmission. HKN and AKN, they, they stay, stay the same, and activation of the user is not changing. Once we say the user is active or not active, it will not change during the period of, of observation. So, we will also deal with models where the channel and the user activity is not changed over multiple slots. <coughs> so, let's look into what are the sources of uncertainty in this model. The main problem in uh, communication theoretic treatment versus protocol treatment of this system is that the protocols observe packets as atomic units. There's nothing inside the packet. You know, this, uh, uh, this is an uh, atom, and this atom you know, cannot be divided. On the other hand, the uh, communication theory says, no, there are symbols, and these symbols constitute the packet. So the most honest model would be to take the symbols and decide to make packet based on a certain number of symbols. The, the important point is that packet uh, or slotted channel is an abstraction that we take in order to simplify our task of designing the protocol. But you can also enrich the model and say, uh, I can also look into the internal structure of the packet and then make a more elaborate protocol compared to the previous. So, what are the sources of uncertainty here? HKN, the channel, is in principle unknown. We don't know the channel between you and the base station. Because if you knew the channel, 
then in the same procedure where you estimate the channel, you could also say I'm, I'm active, and you know you have the knowledge that the user has to trust. So it's reasonable to, trust, to assume that the HKM is trustable. AKM is the main unknown in the protocols, whether the user is active or not. HKM. What does HKM contain in practical systems? HKM is the transmitted signal. So what is contained inside HKM? If we are talking about packets, there's some quadrant information, some data. Yes, exactly. So we have some metadata explaining who the sender of the packet is, some and signal. data, which is you know, uh, the, the, the useful data of the packet. And ZK is the noise, which is the unknown, but we have always to consider this unknown, so we design our systems with respect to it. So the central role in massive machine type communication is played by the uncertainty contained in the variable AKM. So the unknown activation of the users. Sometimes we can assume that the total number of active users can be known or can be estimated. So you don't know actually who is active, but you know kind of how many active you should expect, based, for example, on the arrival process, past statistics. And you say, with high probability, there will be 10 users. With high probability, there will be 50 users. That is kind of an estimation. Or you can run a specific uh, procedure to estimate how many are active without actually risk discovering who, is, who, is, who, who are all that are active. Okay? How, how could we do that? What do you think? Energy, Energy detection is possible. You say all of you transmit, and then you measure the energy, right? But they have different channels. So how do we find that? Okay, so they can do channel inversion, right? For example, they say that my the received power from me has to be a value p, and if everybody says that, then you have to de de detect uh, what is the level of energy, total energy received, right? kp or k minus 1p or so. That's in principle possible. Another way to do it uh, is to estimation process. You say, all of you that are active, I know that there are 10,000 potentially active. I can say, all of you that are active, Transmit in the next slot with probability 10 to the minus 6. Then in the <coughs> slot afterwards, 10 to the minus 5. In the slot afterwards, 10 to the minus 4. Right? So then I'm going to observe how many responses I got in the first, in the second, and the third. Right? And based on that, I can make an estimator to say, if I have observed this, uh, that the first one was empty, second was empty, the third one was collision, then the most likely number of users is this. Do you get this? So you can actually sample the activity of the users and make an estimate. So the interesting thing is that for the modeling purpose, we can make AKN to be part of the channel. So we say that uh, this is just a mathematical manipulation of this. We can say that. Our channel is not HKN, but our channel is HKN multiple AKN. So if, for example, HKN, oh sorry, if HKN is a uh, Gaussian distributed, and AKN is a, uh, is, is a complex Gaussian variable with certain mean value, and AKN is the binary Bernoulli variable, that means that we can have the channel, which is bernoulli gauss distribution. So it's not uh, it's the type of fading is kind of artificial, modulated by the activity of the users. You can also make another choice. You can say HKN is part of the symbol. So you say that uh, I, I transmit whenever I don't have anything to transmit. I'm actually transmitting a symbol which is called zero symbol or zero message. But whenever I have something to transmit, 
I'm picking randomly and uniformly from M messages and I'm trying to index message. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is that these are all different approaches that you can have to model the, the system. What is a collision model? Now let's take the simplest model. What is a collision model? Collision model means that we neglect the noise, there is no noise. So the users are transmitting packets. So the packet is the atomic unit, not the symbol. We don't care what is inside the packet. What we say is put all channel coefficients equal to 1. If you go back in this model, you remove this, you put this equal to 1, so you basically get AKN multiple XN. And the collision model is extreme in a sense that it says that if no user is active, then you get 0. If one user is active, then you get the packet correctly. If two or more users are active, then you get a collision. That's a collision model. Uh, it's a representation of reality. It doesn't, the reality doesn't work like that. But you say, I, I would say that this is a, a collision if I receive something, but it's not correct. So, how can we justify this? You know, when you make a model, it's very important to bring it to reality, to say which part of reality this model is reflecting. So how can we get the channel coefficients to be equal to 1? So we say that, as, uh, as you mentioned, we can do channel inversion. So the, the base station sends a broadcast signal, a pilot, in the downlink. You measure the channel. You say, now, that my channel, HKN, is equal to this and that, because you can measure it. And you use the electromagnetic reciprocity. And you know that when you transmit on the same channel, the channel will be the same in the uplink, right? So you say, I want to induce my coefficient at the reception to be equal to 1 or to any other pre-agreed value, right? So what you will do is a channel inversion. Take your, take, your, uh, take your power, put it equal to 1 over what you have measured to the square. However, if the channel is very weak, this will be very small. That means that this will be very, uh, very high. In that case, the device sets AKN equal to zero. You see, this, with this model, we can integrate all things together. So, so now, the activation of the user depends on two things. Whether the user has a packet, or whether the user, and actually whether the, the channel of that user is sufficiently strong to transfer that packet. In both cases, the interesting thing, is that the set of activated users is random. So by not knowing the channels, we do, we, do not, um, we do not contribute to knowing something about the users. We just increase actually the uncertainty. So we still have to do with uncertain set of users. OK, so, that's, so we say that the collision model makes sense if all the active users can have the same received power at the, uh, at the base station. So here, this is the model that you are getting. No noise, no channel. XKN is a fixed rate signal. And it's decodable if only there is no interference. So what you're saying in this collision model, you say that if there are two that are active, at least, then the interfering signal makes impossible to decode anything. But if there is a, uh, if there is one transmission only, then this is successful. This is the classical Aloha model. Which uh, my point was to go through this uh, in a very elementary way to see how the general model can be transformed into an Aloha model. Because Aloha papers usually don't start with this, right? They say, let's assume that there's a collision. But I think it's important for us to understand how do we start from the general model and what do we need to do to come to the Aloha model. So in this model, if we have a single slot where the user has an opportunity to transmit, then this brings us to the classic, uh, classical objective of random access. Choose the probability of being active 
such that to maximize the probability that there will be only one transit. So basically, uh, if we are a group of uh, I don't care, 16 people, and there is place only for one of us to go to the door, so if we two at the same time go to the door, we have to back off because we cannot go to the door. So what, and we cannot agree who should go to the door. How should we choose our probability so that with highest probability, one person goes out of the door? So what should be the probability? We are 17 people. What should be the probability? How can I maximize the probability that somebody goes outside of the door? It's 1 over n, 1 over 17, right? So, that, so that, that basically, you have to know how many active contenders are there in order to be able to choose the probability optimally. OK? So I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not trying to solve here all these problems of uh, estimation and so on, but I'm just trying to highlight what are the issues. Because when people say this is optimal to do in Aloha system, then you always have to critically ask, OK, but how do you know the number of users? Right? And so that you need to run an estimation procedure. But if you run an estimation procedure, then it's not pure Aloha system because you found out something else for the users. So you can actually maybe resolve them in a different way. Now let's. Uh, Let's enrich a little bit the model and say, let's bring back the noise. Let's bring back the channel again. Let's say that the, the users are not really inverting the channels. So the good users have good channel. Bad users have bad channel. So it's a low, low receive signal. So here we do not assume that the channel coefficients are 1, but we make another dishonest assumption saying that they are known or can be estimated. How can we justify this? Well, if we have a long-term deployment of smart meters, of whatever we have communicated before, then we kind of know that the channel gain of this guy is equal to some value, of another guy is another value, and so on. OK? Then, or actually, you can have those dedicated pilot sequences within the packets to estimate. What is, the, what is the channel? But then, if there's interference between the packets, you're not getting a pure estimation of the channel, which appears to be a major problem in other systems, right? So this is not, it's not just easy to say that you can estimate the channel. It's kind of, for example, the massive MIMO, that's the rocket science is how to estimate the channel. So, uh, so here, we say that we have fixed rate signals. Then can be, that can be decoded when the signal to interference ratio is satisfied. So basically, we have a user that has a weak signal and the user that has a strong signal. They transmit simultaneously. So what happens is, of course, we decode the strong user. But in the collision model, the strong user is not decoded. So here, we allowed to look into the physical uh, you know, structure of the channel, and suddenly we can decode something else compared to before. So uh, what can happen is uh, this can lead to successive interference cancellation, meaning that if there's a strongest user, you take it, decode it, then you go to decode the weaker user, decode it, then you go to the third user, and so on. So you see, when we allowed uh, some different arithmetic in the channel here, then we have more users coming out of the of the contention process. And previously, it was only collision. Yes? But this means you have to rank the users according to who is strong and who then is weaker, who, right? You have to put them in some order from the stronger to the weaker. Yes, right? yes. You have to detect that. You have to detect that. So you have to have, find a way to detect who is the strongest user. For example, they can have. Uh, if they're using the same preamble, all of them, then you can see uh, which channel gain gives the highest preamble, and then you can decode that user, right? But yes. they, they, if, even if even if they even if they use the if they use the same preamble, but their channel is different, 
then you will differentiate the user according to the channel, right? Because you say the user with the channel coefficient h, which I estimated, will be decoded first because he uses the strongest uh, preamble. They can also use different preambles, as you say. Uh, so then, uh, then I can say the user that used that preamble will be decoded first, the second preamble will be decoded second, and so on. Actually, good that you brought this, because we can enrich further the model with something else. I didn't put this on the slides, but this could be used in practical systems. <coughs> so let's take uh, the case of RFID. So in RFID, uh, you know, RFID are cheap devices, uh, which are kind of powered remotely and you activate their electronics based on a radio wave. But they are cheap and they are unreliably produced and they are imprecise. So the oscillators are not equal to what is the calibrated value of the oscillator. Then, uh, what we can have is that they are sending some preamble. Sorry. Some preamble which goes like this. That's it. However, because the devices are manufactured imprecisely, the preamble of the, the other guy will be like this. Because they are not, the value of T is different, from different for different users. Okay? That means that this is giving you another basis to differentiate the devices. So you go to, they all send the same preamble. But you say, the guy who sent the, the preamble and whose timing here is T1, that I'm going to decode first. This is a clever, relatively solution, but it's not engine, this is not controlled engineering, right? So you're relying on some other factors to enable your system to, to differentiate the device. However, in uh, ultra-narrowband systems, like Sigfox and LoRa and so on. Actually, ultra narrowband by definition means that the precision of the carrier is worse than the bandwidth of the signal. So the bandwidth of the signal is so narrow that it's narrower than the precision of the carrier where, the, where you put the signal. So actually, the impreciseness of the carrier can also be used to differentiate the devices and actually decode them in the time frequency domain. So anything in principle, anything which can differentiate the devices, the channel, the activity coefficient, the oscillator, the frequency, anything can be used as a signature to extract different users. But the question is what gives us the performance benefit in terms of some uh, metric, I mean this this one does, is very good practically, but does not justify some performance benefit, while the selection of the user based on the channel quality, for example, mm -hmm. justifies some performance improvement, right? E exactly. But on the other hand, if with this, if you combine both, you say I use the channel quality, and I use the defects of the users. And you have two different levels of... Yes, two different levels of tuning and getting... Uh, tuning. Right? So, because I made, I think the, the main point in introducing this, co this uh, capture model, as it's called, capture means that the signal of one user is so strong that you can, that you can capture the signal despite the interference. The point is that if you enrich the model to allow capture, then you can get the benefit with respect to the collision model, but there is also a cost in it, right, in the process. And then if you enrich the model to account for the defects in the devices, in a different then you can further enrich it. But this also requires also some cost, right? Because that then you don't, you, you're not perfectly synchronized in frequency, but you have to sample the time frequency continuum in order to find where the different users are lying, right? Because they're deviating from the nominal uh, time frequency synchronization. What, what I'm trying to say here is that new level of complexity in the model can bring you performance at certain cost at the receiver. Okay. So, so 
many of you have seen uh, in your courses information theory, the standard information theoretic model. Standard information theoretic model is the one where AKN doesn't exist. Everybody is active. You know who is active, and they know each, each other, with each other who is active, right? Because if, uh, well, the question there is, uh, find the n tuples of achievable rates, assuming very large or infinite, asymptotically infinite code words. So you want to find out which data rates they should select, can they select, so that they are decoded, all of them are decoded correctly with high probability. I repeat, all of them. So, so that means that uh, you, you look in the capacity region so that you, that you say that if you choose your rate like this and you choose your rate like this, then both of you will be decoded with high probability. So if you have to, the classical two-user multiple access channel, we have the, you know, the capacity region, <coughs> which means that if the user one chooses the rate here, and the user two chooses the rate here, then this point is inside the capacity region. So both can be decoded correctly. However, choosing these rates means that somebody has to tell them how to choose it, right? They, they, they have to know something. They have to coordinate with each other. Because if the user one chooses the rate to be here, and the user two chooses the rate to be here, then this point is not within the region. None of them will be decoded correctly. But then brings, that brings us to the concept of collision. Actually, collision just means that I'm unable to decode the users. So actually, we can in this model, we can nicely fit the collision by saying collision means selecting data rates which lie, lie outside of the uh, capacity region. The problem is that this is valid when we have very long packets. On the other hand, we are speaking about low latency packets, you know, packets, atomic unit, and so on. To make sense out of this, you can say that if the number of symbols within the packet is sufficiently large, 500, 1,000, for example, then you can count that within each transmission, you have this multiple access channel where you can apply the information theoretic bounds. In principle. But it doesn't make sense if you have short packets of uh, 10 symbols to apply these bounds. So here we don't deal at all with the uncertainty of which user is active and which not. No. We if, wrote this. We if, you read, if you read the, uh, the, if you read the papers on uh, capacity of multiple access channel, everything is known about the activation. Y yes, I know. So by doing this, we don't have to deal with the activity of the user. We no. just find out if we, it's within the capacity region that we're done. No, we find out, basically, here is just uh, to find out how to tell to the users which rates they should select mm -hmm. so that they satisfy some criteria, for example. What is possible to, to select? This has nothing to do with the uncertainty of the channel, even the uncertainty of the user. This has to deal only with, given the channels which are known, given the SNL and the individual users that are known, uh, and given that the noise has an effect, given some SNR, what is that you can achieve? But I think this interpretation of the collision as a point outside of the capacity region is, is kind of neat. That uh, connects the two, the two concepts. What else this could tell me? This is an important thing. Let's say that he selected the point here, this user one. User two selected the point here. Then the point of, in the multiple access region will be this one. Okay? Let's say they have the symmetrical, they select the same rate. So the same rates they have to lie on this uh, line. So this, they select this rate. So it's outside of the region. Somehow, uh, we tell to them to try again, and somehow user one succeeds to be the only one transmitted. So let's say that I say to these two users, transmit. 
then you transmit, there is a collision because you are not coordinated. Then I say I flip a coin, and then Anna stays quiet, Elizabeth transmits. So if she is user two, oh, sorry, user one, uh, that means that if she transmits alone, the point in the region is actually this one. Because his rate is now zero. Right? Then, if I decode the signal of Elizabeth now, I can go to the previous slot, cancel her signal from there, and then, equivalently, in the previous slot, she is transmitting at the rate zero, and I can decode Anna's signal. This is what is called code slotted access, and you are going to hear about it tomorrow. But you can relate it to the capacity region and the, the collision as well. So if you are lying outside the capacity region, what you can do is uh, both of you retransmit the same thing, or you can have for example, one of you retransmit, and the other remember, and then do the successive interference cancellation. Let's let's just uh, look into this. If you transmit here in this region, and I say both of you retransmit, what will happen with the capacity region? So if I can do change combining of both transmissions, right? That means that the capacity region actually will increase, right? So, so that means that if the capacity region increases sufficiently to embrace the point at which you're transmitting, it can decode everything. But if I ask only one of you to transmit, then I can decode it and then go to the previous, how to say, signal, and just, uh, just decode it. Also, we can, we can stay in the speculative <laughs> region here. Let's say that uh, you have, in the first slot, you receive H1, X1, plus H2, X, X2, plus some noise. Right? So the second is H1, X, X1, plus Z2. The channel has not changed, right? So what I, what I said was that you are going to decode this. You are going to find this out. After you decode this, you are going to cancel it from here, right? The second case was where I put the same transmission, right? So here, what, what we can do is uh, actually uh, add them up. Each of them will be change combined, right? So so basically, the, uh, the SNR of this user will increase two times, and of this user will increase two times. So that means that the overall capacity region will increase. But I can do something else even. I can tell them, retransmit, but one of you change the sign. Is this better or no? Please. Tell, please explain why it is better. No, if you switch. Um, if you switch the sign. Not only the sign, but. Oh, for the, the sign, for example, would be also okay here to solve there. You're kind of getting two independent equations. So the rank of this becomes two. And you are solving a system like in MIMO. So you're kind of on purpose creating a nice MIMO channel here. But as you said, you can also make uh, the conjugate it and whatever. Here the point is to, because there are two streams, you want to, you want to multiply the two streams. So my point is that once you go to these models, there, there can be other ideas coming up. This idea with inverting the sign doesn't exist in the collision model, right? Because the collision model, there are no signs. OK? You're still assuming that the chain is the same. Channel is the same. Channel is the same. What if the channel is not the same? What stays the same if the channel is not the same? 
the data is, but then you need to replicate the, 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 the channel, reconstruct, yes. and then subscribe. It's not easy, but it is interesting direction, right? Because then the channel is the same in both cases. The, the data is the same in both cases, but not the channel. So you might try to find out how to combine. So they need to manage the channel. Then it's a blind kind of uh, yeah. in the second case, right? Because you don't know the channel, but you know that the data is the same, so you can yeah, use this yeah, fact. OK. There is a, this, this kind of brings us to another generalization of the model, which is a vector channel model. So the example where I was telling that we are transmitting in one slot and then in the second slot, this is not a single transmission, this is a vector of transmission. So you can generalize this. You can say, let's take uh, into account many slots where, uh, Sorry. Let's take into account many slots, like M slots. And in these M slots, in some slots you transmit, in other slots you're not transmitting, right? So you kind of you can make a signature in which slot you transmit, in which slot you're not transmitting. This is the basis of uh, code random access, which is going to be lectured tomorrow by Chelmich. So here S is the signature matrix has the role of a spreading code in a CDMA system. Uh, we have uh, put the channel to be equal to one, uh, but also we can make the channel to be part of S. Uh, and this model shows relation to compressed sensing. How many of you have heard about compressed sensing? So compressed sensing, the point is that you have a large vector where most of the members are zero, some are equal to one. And you want to find out which of them are equal to one. And then this is uh, what is called the measurement ma matrix, where, where these vectors are presented to you. This vector is kind of uh, giving you observations, uh, in this case, through some signature codes. So when you look at the signatures, you want to figure out who is active. And this is the, 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 in principle, the base station is solving a compressed sensing problem. Right? So this has been noticed by people in uh, signal processing, and actually there are many works coming out now where they look into this massive axis problem as a problem in compressive sensing. So going to some more information theoretic models, which are suited for uh, massive access. You know, the model I mentioned previously, the classical information theoretic model, is not suitable for massive access because it does not take into account the activity of the users. So there is this very recent work where they define not multiple access, but they define a many access channel, as they call it. So in the many access channel, we have this uh, vector model of uh, WK is the message sent by the Kate user. SK is the signature of the Kate user. And then we are observing LN is the total number of users, some of which are active. The, the users that are not active are sending a special zero code word. You remember I said before in the model that we can take the activity of the user to be either part of the message set or part of the channel. So here is a part of the message set. Each user access, accesses the, the channel independently with uh, alpha n, which means that if accessing the channel, the user is picking randomly and uniformly one of the m messages and transmitting it. If not accessing, it's sending zero. The new thing which they made in this paper is that they tied the number of possible users to the packet block length n. They say, let's look in the packet block length n, and let's assume that the total number of users depend is a function of this n. So the larger the block length, the more users can be supported. That's obvious, right? Because uh, we have more. But the question is how this number is changed. 
So the central importance here has detecting the set of active users. So basically detecting, which is inverse to, to, to detecting the users that send the zero message. If you detect which users are sending the zero message, then you have detected for the active ones, right? That's all the others. So this is again related to the sparse recovery or confess sensing. This is analyzed in this paper when both number of users and block length go to infinity. The question is, how do they go to infinity? And uh, the key element is user detection based on signatures. And error is defined based on joint decoding of all users. So what they say is the error occurs when not all the users are simultaneously decoded correctly. This is limiting. Because as the number of users is increasing, then uh, you cannot keep this probability low because there are mo many users contributing to this joint event. So here's an example. Like, how big can be the message that they are sending? And this message is basically equal to logarithm of m, where m is what they pick when, when they transmit. So what they say is that if n is equal, for example, to 4,000, and the number of user grows as n square, then the bn, the number, the, the length of the messages can be equal to this. Right? But when the number of users is growing, is growing slower, like n to the 1.5, then the message can be larger. So you either invest in the number of users or invest in the how large message you can send from the user. You remember my discussion about reliability and you know, this is kind of reflective. You cannot have all at the same time. So one of the limiting, uh, one of the limiting uh, aspects in this uh, model has been that they assume, as in a classical access, uh, multiple access channel, they assume that uh, all users have to be decoded. Right? There's another model. Again, you see, this is uh, so 2017. So we're speaking you know, for things just taken out of the oven now. So uh, uh, Gaussian Mach with HKN equal to 1, the channel coefficient equal to 1. So the key point is the uncertainty of the users. All users use here the same code book. Error is defined from the perspective of a user. So we don't say that the joint event that all users correctly, but we say this user is decoded correctly. The mention of this user is decoded correctly. Another thing, another twist in this is that error occurs if the message is not decoded correctly of the user, or if another user chose the same message. So here, the motivation is that uh, you don't you decode the data without taking care of who the user is. Maybe part of this data, uh, uh, in this case, is the same code book. But in practice, you can make part of this data to reflect the identity of the user. But if if, if you reflect the identity of the user, then that means that it cannot, they cannot select it from the same code book, right? Because user one cannot select the identity two. So here is completely user agnostic. Why it makes sense? Because you can have IoT applications where you don't care about the identity. You just care that here there is an alarm. And then you want to decode that message. So what is found in this paper is that finite block length is the limiting factor when the number of users is low. So we feel the effects of finite block length. That means that by increasing the, uh, the, by increasing the block length size, we get uh, better and better performance because of the block length size. But when we go to the number of, large number of users, the performance is limited, uh, not so much by the block length size, but by the interference from the other users, right? This is in line with kind of what we have seen here as well in the other paper. Finally, there's some work we have done uh, two, three years ago uh, with the most honest model of all, where we say, uh, we don't know AKN and we don't, don't know HKN. We don't know the channel. We have to estimate. We don't know the activity. 
and we have to find the data in the end. So what we did here is uh, we have made uh, this to be the single unknown, so activity of the user and the uh, data, similar to what, what has been done in the other papers. And then the code books of the users are chosen in a way to create linear subspaces because we don't know H, but we can see the linear combination of what has been received. And we say, ah, okay, if it's this linear combination, then most likely it's this, this, and this user plus with it. And within that linear combination, we can decode the individual messages. So uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with non-coherent communication. But uh, in non-coherent uh, communication, the channel H is unknown. But the channel H is a multiplying factor of our data, X. And that means that if X is lying in uh, some linear subspace, multiplying it with a constant will not change the linear subspace. That's the key point in this uh, note here. So I went through the models. Uh, are there any questions? No questions. OK, we can go quickly through some cellular access uh, protocols. And I will stop at Aloha, because enhanced access protocols, you will have them tomorrow. So practically all mobile cellular standards use a similar algorithm for initial connection establishment. And it's an access reservation protocol, where we have random access identifier into the base station, random access response, resource request, resource assignment. And this is normally based on slotted aloha. So slotted aloha is a pretty old protocol. We have, uh, going back to our model, we have uh, end users, homogeneous population, uh, decentralized random access. Link time is divided into slots of equal duration. So this, the packet is an atomic unit. And users content to access the base station. So each user transmits with predefined probability PA. And collision model in which the slot can be idle, single, or collision. This is a collision channel model. And there is feedback after every slot. And this feedback, you know, we, we, it has been assumed for free in the papers. But in, in, in reality, we have to send it. And they have to receive it. It has to be reliable. right? So. Uh, when you go, for example, to very high reliability, you cannot assume that the feedback is ideal because it has to be received, for example, if your target reliability is 10 to the minus 7, then the feedback has to be received with 10 to the minus 9 at least, two orders of magnitude to, to, to treat it as a, as a perfectly reliable. So each user in this solid aloha uh, contents, transmits with a predefined probability PA. And uh, unsuccessful users contend in the next slot. Okay. So throughput is a measure of the efficiency of the system resources. See, the, the average fraction of slots that have successful attempts. For example, we have uh, we are counting the slots. Out of T slots, uh, there were T1 that were with single, T0 with uh, idle, and T2 is with collision. So the throughput is T1 divided by T. Right? And then in Aloha, now this is uh, what we have shown before, that the probability, that the probability PA should be cho chosen to be equal to 1 over the active number of users. right? And then the throughput of a slot Aloha comes to 0 0.37, kind of 37%. And this has been the interesting thing is that this is very inefficient, but this is used in all protocols as we know. And the coded access protocols that you are going to hear about tomorrow, they use some successive interference cancellation, some repetition techniques, which are you know, making a more sophisticated setup for decoding the, 
the packets, actually the throughput can go up to 0 0.8, 0 0.9, asymptotically to 1. Frame solid aloha is, this is related to our vector communication model, because in frame solid aloha, we look in the frame with multiple slots, and the feedback does not come after every slot, it comes after every frame. This is kind of more realistic, right? Uh, the problem is that you cannot adjust your action after every slot. You have to choose your actions and wait for the feedback. <coughs> the throughput is also close to 0 0.37. Uh, when uh, the frame size is approximately equal to the, the, the it, here correctly, but when the, when the frame size is for large numbers is approximately equal to the number of contenders. The point is frame aloha, frame solid aloha is that each user within the frame of size M chooses randomly one slot and transmits. So if M is very large, this has to be equivalent to the previous case where the user chooses to transmit in every slot independently with probability one over two, right? So uh, basically, you see that this approach of using the collision channel and some feedback and not doing anything sophisticated keeps you limited to 0 0.37. That's why we went to other approaches, like with, uh, using the capture effect, successive interference cancellation, and most notably, the enhanced random access with uh, uh, coded, coded random access, which you're going to hear about tomorrow. On the other hand, uh, an another departure from this are the models which have more elaborate processes. So we have some, time, some form of sparse recovery or similar things. Uh, and this is kind of what is used in, uh, let's say, well, uh, systems like Sigfox. Okay? So, as I said, I, I focused very much on different models for communication because I think it's, uh, it's important for you to understand what, what each, each model is offering. And that certain designs are limited within, within the model. 